Hello everybody, my name is Melis Brunet and I am the music director of the Lexington Philharmonic. And today it's my greatest pleasure to be with Ellen Tave Svillage. Hi Ellen. Hi, how are you? My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for being here uh, with us today. It's a great honor to be able to share things with you, with a composer. And I want to introduce you quickly to our audience. You are in my opinion, a very unique and a major figure as an American composer. Um, and I would say, of, of course, extremely talented and hard worker person. And I would like to actually use a word that I generally hate, which is the word genius. And please forgive oh, me. Oh, come on. <laughs> no. I hate it because of everything that people put on the word right now and it seemed like a superhero and thing but i want to come back to the definition of genius and probably it's going to not make you feel comfortable but a genius is a person <laughs> who is exceptionally intelligent or creative either generally or in some particular respect and i'm going really to the essence of the word because i truly believe that you're a genius and it's important to say it and to go back to the roots of the definition and we will see throughout the interview um everything you, that you have achieved at always the highest level and um of creativity and performance you started playing music when you were a toddler two or three years old yeah at five years old you were begging your parents to play the piano yeah and, uh, you had nothing written on paper until you were 10 years old and 10 years old is That's really right. pretty early yeah and, and you said that it was always in your nature to make up music yeah yeah and you you, you always felt that need right i i still don't know why i just it's there for some reason you know like <laughs> whatever <laughs> There was a piano in the house and uh, my mother played little bitty things like doodly do or something. And uh, But when I found out what happens when you press down the keys, I just got really hooked. And uh, I was lucky because the teacher I got when I was five, um, she was, um, <laughs> if she'd been a really good piano teacher for me, I'd probably been a pianist. But, you know, I kept saying to her, she's giving me this stupid kid stuff and and I said I make up better stuff than this and she'd say sit down and shut up you know <laughs> and she finally she finally just said I can't I can't handle you so um I, I was lucky because I really got you know I if I had the right person at that point I think I would have been a pianist probably because I really love the instrument I still do you know yes yeah, so that I mean everything has been very impactful for you. And then you were in high school and in high school, you were such in a wonderful environment. Every time you describe your high school times. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic with a great uh, open mindedness, no discrimination whatsoever. And yep. you were principal trumpet of the band. You were concert master in the orchestra. You also wrote your music that you conducted because the conductor was not confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's um, I it, I just get very sad thinking about the fact that the high school I went to uh, no longer has anything like this uh, in terms of the, and in in the days when I was in high school and I was in Florida and all of the high schools had very strong. Uh, music programs. Um, I mean, it was totally segregated, so I don't. Ha we didn't even know what was going on in the black schools. But in in the schools, whether you were in a poor district or a w rich district or whatever, all had very strong music programs, and it benefited people. It didn't turn people into musicians. It turned people into better this or that. You know, the learning to work with other people and listen to other people and all of this kind of stuff that you do in music. Um, people went on and they did other things in life and did well. Yes. So when I said discrimination, it would be more gender discrimination. In that case, there was like even though you were a woman, you could still be a principal trumpet, which is still seldom in some countries. It's hard to get to principal trumpet um, or concert master. Well, but this was a high school band. We're not talking about a major orchestra or anything. But still, still, you know, I mean, I remember my time as being a kid um, 
I don't know, 20 years later in, in France. And it was not put in and at school. That was not positions that uh, women would win necessarily. Yeah, interesting. Well, we had behind the screen auditions in my high school, which which made a big difference. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the other thing is when uh, I, I always say I just happen to be at the right place at the right time any number of times in my life. Of course, there have been bad times, but it just there were times when nothing could have happened except I was right there then. When I first moved to New York, um, Stokowski had started the American Symphony a couple of years before that. And the American Symphony, was it was a young orchestra, but it was open because Stokowski didn't want any, any problems with a woman or a black or an Asian. There were, there were hardly any Asians in orchestras in those days. Everybody was a white European male. So I, I, got, I got to be in the American Symphony for seven years uh, under some, not just Stokowski, but we had fabulous guest conductors and uh, we did a lot of new music. It was just really quite wonderful, you know. Yes, and inspiring and enabling as well. You went to the Juilliard as well, and you were the first woman to uh, win, earn a doctorate um, in composition in 1975, which is, a, of course, a huge accomplishment. And you studied with Elliot Cutter and Roger Session. And Roger Session, mostly Roger. You know, Roger. I also worked with Elliot, but mostly with, with Roger. And, you know, um, I mean, at this time, the style of writing was very, uh, of course, atonal and um, influenced a lot by uh, European music. Uh, and I, I was wondering how much those two teachers influenced you in your own style, how much or maybe not at all? Well, I would say not not at all. I, I never wanted to write like anybody. But when I was at Juilliard, for instance, we had not only Elliot and Roger, we had David Diamond and Milton Babbitt, it, people all over the map. And they were very generous with their time. You know, even if you weren't their student, they'd you know, you could show them their, your music and talk about it and all of that. Um, so it was a real mixed bag. And I've always liked that. And I've never liked to feel, you know, like I, I have to be on a certain path and do a certain kind of thing or not do this. And and I like I say, I didn't want to write like anybody. And what I say about Roger is that people have always asked me, you know, what did you get from Roger Sessions? And I say I can't really answer that, but all I can tell you is that when while I was working with him, I found my own voice. And I think that's the, the greatest gift a teacher could ever give you. And I don't know how he did it, actually, partly because he was so reserved in a way, you know, he, he didn't want to weigh in. There's different kinds of composition teachers, you know, some jump in and say, but you know, you know this, you know that, but that, 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 so and so did this one. Yeah, he just sort of sat there calmly and kind of listened to what you were doing and looked at your score and asked little questions and things like that. But he didn't weigh in on what you should do. And that that's a big thing. It's very important. The only thing I've I always said, this is what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I was at a party when Elliot Carter was, I think he was about 100, and at the French embassy. And he got some kind of an award. He'd invited a number of people, and we were invited. And Elliot gave his acceptance speech in French. I mean, he was really sharp as a tack at that point. And he knew everybody in the room and all of that. And he, I don't remember whether he was 99 or 100, but he was, he was up there. And um, I, somebody took a picture of me and with a conductor standing behind Elliot in the wheelchair. And in his right hand, he had a glass of champagne. And I said, that's my goal in life. I'd like to be 99 or whatever and have a glass of good French champagne in my hand. <laughs> I signed for that goal too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very good and healthy to me. <laughs> I would like to ask you, because when I listen to your music or when I read your music, I have a lot of emotions coming up to me and and connections that are happening in my brain because yeah. of 
of, of my education, of where I was raised up and things. And a few things that came to mind to me uh, in my feelings and emotions are a, a really deep uh, emotions, almost expressionist in a way. Like I can think of Kokoschka, Oscar Kokoschka's mm -hmm. paintings. And like you are really more in the term of expressionism, more about the emotional experience that the physical reality that's how i feel like i'm having an emotional experience i find also your music extremely visual i don't know why every time i'm in your music i see movies i'm like hitchcock you know like <laughs> um where there is something happening and leading me somewhere so i have question for you and I understand it's very subjective and that's how I feel. But I want to know if there are things like a painting or uh, other arts or uh, poets, um, any other things that are inspiring you and that you feel nourish you in your expression as a musician. Oh, I, I love, you know, visual arts and I love uh, I love literature and I mean it's like I, I'm, I'm a I love the whole thing and it's interesting I was going to tell you about my first symphony because I I started that when I was at the McDowell colony and the McDowell colony is a place in in the, in the states where artists of all kinds go and you get you get a little cottage to to work in and um they they make a point of not um, having things stick out with colors and this uh, the nothing on the walls you know kind of thing everything's kind of beige and I always said all I need to to work is a good light and a good chair and I get to the McDowell County and they give me a, an architect's lamp and they give me a good chair okay and I'm sitting there and I'm just sort of like just frozen in a way. And all of a sudden I look around the room, I realize there isn't a color there. There's nothing, you know, it's just this beige thing. And so I went out and, and got uh, some big leaves and things like that and put them up on the thing. And and there was a, an artist whose work I liked very much. And he, he gave me, or he lent me a, a, a very nice painting and they gave me an easel to put it up on. And, and by the time I got finished with some of this stuff, I, I kind of sat there and went, okay. <laughs> and I never even knew that about myself. I thought all I needed was a light in the chair, you know, and uh, it turned it out that there's something about it. And I always, you know, where I work, I usually have some kind of a view. I did an awful lot of my work uh, looking at the Hudson River and kind of watching it and, and enjoying it. And uh, it, it's... I don't know. I just think that that we're we're kind of like a sponge, you know, and you pick up all kinds of things around you. And what can I say? <laughs> no, thank you. It's very helpful to get to know of your process and what inspires you. I mean, as a performer and interpreter, I I love that because that gives me ideas as well. Yeah, yeah. That informs me more on your music and. Yeah. Um, how you write. So in, in 1975, you, you wrote uh, the piece Symposium that I believe probably Boulez. The Boulez did, yeah. yeah. Um, and at the Juilliard. And you say um, about that piece, and by the way, I cannot find a recording for this piece. Is it recording? No, I don't think it never got recorded. Uh... Okay, I'm taking notes of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I have written about that. I found that you said about this piece that the topic under discussion is presented in an opening statement and the remainder of the piece is given to variations, sometimes character variations, sometimes more abstract permutations, elaboration and commentary on the subjects at hand. Yeah, and and my my feeling is I st you start by creating some DNA, and you don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to go, when or where, but that it have something that can grow. And my example to young composers is the acorn. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the acorn. You nobody's going to look at that and say, "Oh, well, this is going to be a great giant oak tree," but all the information that is necessary to create the giant oak tree is in that little acorn. And so I think very much about material that has some, I feel it has some kind of future 
and I don't even necessarily know because I would I would if if I have a big plan for a work and I do a lot of thinking before I start. If I have a big plan and the, the piece wants to go a slightly different direction, I throw away the plan and go with the piece. Mm. And um, my experience with the first symphony was bizarre because I was <clears throat> at the McDowell Colony, as I said, and I had a Guggenheim Fellowship and I knew that was going to support me for a couple of years. And the McDowell Colony is a wonderful place to be. It was very shall we say, artist friendly, you know, you had this wonderful place to work and they, they brought your lunch in a basket and you, you, you had dinner with your colleagues and friends. And, you know, it was a very lovely environment. And, and I said to myself, here I am at the McDowell Colony and I've got a Guggenheim Fellowship. I'm going to do something really, really stupid. And I started a piece for orchestra. And it was what became my first symphony. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, I really, I had no, I had no prospects of a performance or anything, but I just thought this is a time to do this, you know, why not? <laughs> and so did you complete it there or did you start it there? Not a hundred percent. I got a lot of it done and I always worked on full score because <laughs> I want to, I want to feel the orchestra sitting there looking back at me, you know, where's, where's my music? You know, it's like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I like to feel the orchestra. So I, I always work on full score and I, I worked on full, it, it, those days I was hand copying, which is, you know, a miserable experience, but I always work on full score, but I had no prospects for a performance. And I had to stop before I actually finished the piece because um, I did have a commission for a chamber piece and I had to go to that. You, you probably, I don't know if you know the story of the American Composers Orchestra. Yes. That, that they asked me, can you have something rather quick, you know? Oh no, that I don't know, so please go for it. I got a call from them and somebody was supposed to have a commission and couldn't fulfill it. And can you get us something in, in, I don't know, three weeks, four weeks? It was a relatively short time. And I jumped up and down and said, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I got it done. It was, uh, as a matter of fact, I I, I got a call from um, someone was working for the ACO who uh, I knew from the American Symphony. She worked for Stokowski. And she called me one day. She said, well, I need a title for your piece. We're going to press tomorrow. I said, well, I haven't thought about it. And I, I often get to the end of a piece before I've decided what I'm going to call it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I never sort of like have a title and then go with the title. And so I, she said, Ellen, I need it. I need it. I need it. You're a friend. You got you to gotta do this. So I said, well, it's in, in three movements and it's for orchestra. So call it three movements for orchestra. And then Gunther Schuler, of course, was the conductor of the first performance. And he said, he got me aside one day, said, you know, this is really a symphony. I said, yeah, I, I know, but I didn't want to deal with the issue at the time, you know, when I I was so busy copying the parts, I didn't care what they called it. You know, I just wanted to get all the parts done. <laughs> well, great stories about the titles of the piece. I'm so happy to hear about what <laughs> why it was going this way. You, you talk about handwriting and i have a question for you and i want to show it on the screen for the audience and okay uh, and i'm sorry there are my own markings in there but this is your handwriting correct uh i think so let me just yes oh yeah yes and um it's it's absolutely fascinating because it's so precise so clear so clean at the same time and you mentioned that that was a time where when you had to go through handwriting everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I find absolutely fascinating is that there are so many composers who go to the piano first, write for piano. But you tell me that from the day one, you've got yes. your orchestra there and you start everything orchestra. Well, the piano is a totally different animal, you know, than, than any other animal in the orchestra. And I want to feel the orchestra. And, and in fact, a lot of my piano reductions of, of the solo pieces, uh, I call them piano strations. <laughs> they're, they're not necessarily good because they weren't written at the piano. They were written on the orchestra, you know, and it's hard to sometimes get them to work 
That's fascinating. So, for example, this is based around A at the beginning and the minor third, la do, la do, la do. Yeah. So when you heard that in your, in your or I'm sorry, I'm going to ask questions because I, as a conductor, I'm <laughs> fascinated now. Did you hear this occurring, as you would say, this cell uh, going from that? Did you hear it as just the intervals or did you already hear the colors where you put with some symbol? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, you heard all of that immediately, and you write it. Yeah, it is not uh, music is not um, just notes on a page. It's it's, and, and every instrument is like a different animal, in my opinion. They have different weight. They have different ways of moving. And uh, no, no, no. I I um, I'm always thinking of the somebody playing that particular instrument that I'm writing for at the moment. And I also feel that, that music has to breathe. And a lot of things that people are doing on computer now, I mean, I, I use a computer, you know, I, as I say, I, I did not like hand copying, but I, I, you know, I often, I usually turn off the sound when I'm, when I'm working on something because it's so, it's so robotic and mechanical and, and it doesn't breathe. And it, it's, it's very interesting. I remember when I first started doing it, I said, to myself, I stopped one day. I said, "Why do I dislike this playback so much?" And I answered my question. You know, I, thought, I started to think, "Well, it doesn't breathe." And if you're a performer, the music is you're breathing the music, and um, and and it's it's like humanity. You know, it's it's like the pulse isn't like a click track. Pulse is like the human pulse, and it, it it goes up and down, and you know you get excited, it goes faster, and you you know you, you relax, it goes a little slower. I mean, it, it's all there's all of these nuances that are human things, you know. And um, anyway, so that, that's kind of the way I I like to think about it. I I just want to let the onion audience know that it's not all composers and it's very very unique to have a composer who have such has such a deep sense of the color of the instrument and and a joy of playing with that uh from the start of the yeah. so i find it absolutely fascinating and that comes you love the sound of the instruments and you have played so many instruments and you have been in ensembles from a very early age so you were also able to develop and that's why music education in our schools is so important for them. I agree. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that uh, if I'm writing for an instrument that I've played, I might have played the Haydn concerto in, trump in trumpet on high school, mm -hmm. but I don't think I know enough about it, a trumpet. You know what I mean? In other words, I, I don't want to be stuck with my understanding of an instrument. I want to go further. And it, particularly if it's an instrument that I've played, I, I really like to go off in a different direction in a way. And and I, I do feel that a beautiful thing in, that's happened in my professional lifetime is that there are instruments that have just blossomed in incredible ways. And I think of the, the contrabass instrument. And there, there was always in history, there was always one guy over here or over there that could really play, but now the level is just risen, risen, risen. And it, it, it's just wonderful what you can write for the double bass now. I have a, a piece uh, that's like the, the Schubert Trout Quintet. And what he did with the bass at that time was really, you know, very, very, you know, forward looking. Mm -hmm. I, I could do so much more mm -hmm. with, with the modern bass player. Absolutely, it, yeah. It's just really wonderful. And, and um, I have a concerto for bass trombone and things a bass can trombone can do now is like unbelievable. Yeah. And all of the levels is sort of gone up and up and up. And particularly where you have people, you know, they hear something now and they know they can do it. And it's, it's really quite remarkable. So, so is there now an, uh, some instrument that you have not yet written for and you would love no, uh, spend more time because of that. Oh like, yes, of course. Yeah, like what, for example? I I have just finished a, a concerto for alto sax and wind wind uh, ensemble, and I wrote a piece for uh, alto sax and string quartet a number of years ago, and I was offered this commission, and I thought it was a great idea, and then I thought, you know, I just don't know enough 
about the alto sax. And so I really dug in to, to learn as much as I possibly could and um, talk to everybody I knew who played it. You know, I mean, all this kind of stuff. And I ended up actually writing the piece a year and a half before it was supposed to be performed. <laughs> And I was lucky that the uh, the the guy who commissioned it uh, was able to get an early performance because they had a string quartet coming in, the Chicago Quartet, and we'd had a relationship and they, they said they'd be happy to do it. So, but it's just sort of like, it's, it's all this, this kind of this mysterious nature to it. Like, what is there about an instrument that, that just sort of pulls me, you know, into it? And it's hard to say. <laughs> I want to go back to the first symphony here. And I have the feeling that um, it's probably very much in in your language, in, in your compositional process, like for symposium, to go from the accord and build everything. I, I feel it's the very same process for this symphony number one. And you have used the term of continuous variation, uh, which is a term coming from biology. Um, but yeah. Applied uh, applied to music, could we say that it's a musical variation showing an unbroken range of characteristics? For example, an interval of <laughs> minor third, and you vary around that. Yeah, um, I, I, I would prefer that to, uh, you know, a, just a theoretical <laughs> analysis. <laughs> I, because I, I think that's what it is, you know, it's really like a living thing. It's like a plant. It's like a person. It's like, uh, it's not like something that's on the blackboard. No. Absolutely. And we have called our concerts continuous variations. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, yes. that's where I thought <laughs> you were doing a, a piece that the Tibor thoroughly finished, Bartok. Jeez. Yes, absolutely. So about this piece, are there other composers in that, there are a few composers who, who proceed the, the same way, like I can think of Georgi Ligeti or Brahms. Um, are they, have you, are you in, inspired? I not say like copying, because obviously you are your own composer with your own style and thing, but yeah. are there some scores you, you have enjoyed diving into when you were younger and you kind of enjoyed seeing that process as well? Well, I love the repertoire. And one of the most wonderful classes I had in college was with uh, Edward Kilinje in the Beethoven Piano Sonatas. And he started each uh, lesson, we, we, we were a small group, basically, talking about who the piece was written for and certain things, analysis and so on. And then he sat down and played a great performance. And just the whole thing of going through Beethoven's life and seeing how he blossomed and how he went here and there unexpectedly, you know, and, but it was all sort of bonded in a way and at the same time blossoming in a different, I think you, you use a, a plant, you know, analogy um i think I, I think of that and I, look at mozart for god's sake mozart was i always say when i was learning how to tie my shoes he was writing masterpieces you know but look how far he went in his life and where he was in his late 30s and how he bloomed you know it just i don't know that i that is something that i i just want to get out of the way of it you know what i'm saying Absolutely. Not think too much about I'm doing this for this reason or that. I want to get captured by the musical material and then go with that. May I ask you if, because you just mentioned there is a piece for saxophone that you just finished, is there something else you're working on right now? If it's not top secret, and you can share that with us. Well, this was just, you know, just done, you know, um, and I am um, I have a concerto for two pianos and orchestra coming up in uh, May. I don't know. <laughs> what can I say? It's like a, a continuous exploration in a way. And it's interesting, you know, the I also play jazz. Uh, when I was in college, I played the bebop trumpet and, and big band jazz. And there's something in, in the jazz scene that is, is fascinating to me. And um, sometimes it pops up in my music, you know, and I, 
I, I don't ever say I'm going to put jazz in here or something, but it's like sometimes the next thing I'm writing is, is like a jazz lick and, and uh, that's okay with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see a Gillespie <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I know you already told me that, but are there any pieces of yours that are not having a public recording or accessible recording yet and that you would love for them to be recorded and accessible for audience? I'm, I'm asking you these questions for people like me as performers. We are yeah. very interested or, and probably many of people watching big chamber music, big orchestral music, other things that you can think of yours that you would love to see see recorded well i i think i've been really really fortunate to have an awful lot of recordings of my music and you know i like that i mean i and something is interesting I, i love it when one performance is different from another and that's an interesting thing about the the recording world is that you can have the same piece done by different people and recorded at a different time and it's it's it comes across rather different And it's it's not that there's, you know, the, the perfect rendition of all of the notes or something. It's like it's an interpretation. Mm-hmm. And and I like that. And so I'm, if, there, if something is going to be recorded again, I, I don't mind that because it's 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 a different living, breathing element of the same piece. Yes, uh- Uh, you have said, and uh, basically, uh, you also written piece. I think your fantasy for violin gives some freedom to the, oh, yeah. um, to the interpreter. So that's also something really good to know for me as a performer is that you said that you like you were getting a kick out of uh, some performances where the performers really own what they are going for in your music. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And the thing about the fantasy for, for solo violin, I, I was commissioned to write something that all of the semifinalists in the Indianapolis competition would have to play. Well, I couldn't work with any one of them. You know, that wouldn't be fair. And I thought, They wouldn't know who the pianist is going to be. So why saddle them with that, you know? And so I not only did a piece for solo violin, I, I made a point of saying in the, in the, the uh, score, please feel free, particularly with the 16th note passages, to interpret them as you will, and to make the piece your piece. And it was it was amazing that I mean, I heard so many different performances, you know, and uh, this one did a little jazz, this and the other one was played things like Haydn and somebody else played a little bluegrassy. I mean, it was really quite all over the map. And I loved it. I loved it. That gives that freedom to other yeah. artists to create. Well, I like it when I when I it's like I turn over the piece and now it's not my piece. It's your piece. Have you, Ellen? Have you ever gone to Lexington, Kentucky? Yes, sure, sure. Yes, yes. I've, I've been oh, there. Oh, wonderful! Okay, do you have? So that's where we will play your first symphony. I um, know. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. Would you have a few words to tell our audience in Lexington who will come to the concert? Do you have a few words for our audience members? Well, I just always say, um, people sometimes say to me, what should I listen for in your music? And I say, listen for the next thing. S- start at the beginning of the thing. Open your ears, listen to the way it begins, and just see where it goes. And I, mean, I should say, hear where it goes. And go go with it. And maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it. Whatever, it's, the point is this, that you shouldn't have some kind of a formula in mind, you know. Music form cannot be put on the blackboard. There are certain things that you could illustrate on the blackboard, but when you're dealing with the temporal element of music, I think the best way for somebody to listen is just to open the ears and see where, see where things are going to go. And just try to go with it. And and you know, like it's you can change your mind. You know, you could you could hear something once and think, I'm not so sure I like that. And then you hear it again and you really like it. And other times almost the opposite. It's 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 a very human experience. Um it, it's not 
you know, something cut and dried. And uh, and I, I think the audiences today are pretty open minded. And I, I like that. That's really nice. They are in for a treat in Lexington. So you can come. It's going to be Saturday at 7.30. And yeah. the first symphony by Ellen Tave Svilich. And do you have any things that you would like to add at this point? Well, uh, toy, toy, toy. And I wish I could be there to hear. And I, I'm, I'm just very excited that you're doing it. And it hadn't been done for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And what can I say? It's not my piece. It's our piece. Well, thank you so much, Helen, for being with us and for taking time out of your precious creative time to share that with our audience. We really are so much looking forward to discover your music in our community. Well, I'm honored that you're playing it.